Okay. Um, what I want to do in this sh short period of time is talk not only uh, about medical marijuana, but place it within a context. And I think it's a context which is, a, is an important one because it touches on uh, a whole range of interesting and difficult questions that are influencing how, how drug policy in general is being dealt with. Uh, it's easy at one level to say that uh, uh, medical marijuana is some sort of beachhead for uh, generalised access, um, and that, that to a certain extent that's true. Uh, but the broader question about what to do with the significant problem that we have with illegal drugs in general is taxing a lot of minds, and uh, it would be fair to say there's a lot of uh, pressure on the international stage to do something. And in fact, uh, some of that attention has uh, really reached a bit of a, a peak um, with a group called um, Australia 21. There was a major report which came out, and that backed on to an international report which said that the problem with illicit drugs and how we deal with them is so great and has become so difficult that we must do something and we must change. So on a, on a global scale, uh, and we're all familiar with the types of imagery that we, we tend to see about cartels and Mexican drug wars and uh, huge death and damage and destruction, and we, we do start to wonder whether there is a, a better approach. And a lot of that difficulty and a lot of that uh, pain, and let's remember that ultimately the pain really gets felt not only in that drug war sense or that cartel and all that death and damage, but in the individual lives which are directly affected. And I suspect that if we had a, and I'm not going to ask, it, but if we had any show of hands here about an awareness within either our families uh, or um, uh, friendships or other relationships about people we know who have a, a struggle with, with drug abuse, um, I suspect there'd be a significant showing of hands. Uh, and that's not only true for hardcore addiction, where something gets so difficult that it really does damage and destroy people's lives, but also the whole gamut, the whole range of uh, illicit drug use, which causes some degree of problem or trouble along the way. So what I want to do is focus, as I said, on medical marijuana, because that's the hot topic, uh, but it, it's, it's part of this bigger picture. So uh, here it is, and it, it's kind of strange in a way looking at something that looks quite, quite humble. Uh, it's just a weed, really, that it could create this kind of, of angst. Um, there's a historical connection with medical use, and that medical use goes back a long, long way, millennia, um, where cannabis has been used medicinally. But we are in the 21st century, and so we bring a new t paradigm, and I want to say a bit more about this shortly, a new paradigm to the way that we deal with medicines. So despite that history, we now have a far more evidence-based context for dealing with the development of medicines. I'd also like to say a little bit shortly about things like the doctor-patient relationship and the purpose of medicine, because that's the contextual construct within which we think about medicines. And that has a rich history too. But I also want to make a distinction right at the start here. Uh, and this is, this is kind of a difficult one, and I suspect is right at the, the, the heart of things. And the distinction is between use and abuse, right use and wrong use. And this is where a moral or ethical element uh, comes into play and is right at the touch point of where those who really would want something like marijuana available for recreational use will get very angry and annoyed that an ethical argument is being used at all. Uh, anything that would suggest that the, an individual does not have freedom to alter their own mind or to change the way they perceive the world through drug, uh, through a particular, whatever drug we're talking about, that actually does get to be a bit of a touchstone. And so, it's interesting that if we look at other drugs, and let's leave some illicits aside for a moment and think about things like benzodiazepines um, or uh, painkillers like oxycodone or morphine, we do have now a fairly good understanding 
about the distinction. And most doctors will be very, very clear on that and make that distinction. If they have someone coming into the clinic asking for a benzodiazepine, they should do a medical history, they do all the normal things that a doctor does and determine whether in fact this is a medication being used for its correct medicinal purpose. So they make that distinction. So that distinction should also hold for the illicit drugs as well. Why does cannabis, we'll zero in on cannabis now, why does cannabis have an effect? And this is where I hope you'll indulge me for a moment with a little bit of science, uh, because this is important. I remember back when I, in my early neuroscience days, when there was great excitement in the field, when uh, natural opiate-like substances were found in the brain. Uh, substance enkephalin and endorphins and most people now it's it's kind of hit the the popular vocabulary that we have an endorphin rush uh, or uh, um, uh, an endorphin high so within the brain there are natural opiate like substances morphine like substances which act as transmitters communications between cells um, and really in one respect we shouldn't have had that great excitement in the field, because it makes perfect sense that there should be actual receptors in the brain for opiates. Well, it turns out there's very much the same sort of thing for cannabis-like substances in the brain. So we talk about an endo within endogenous cannabinoid system. And so that system is like the, the endogenous opiate system, and there are specific receptors being identified. And quite apart from thinking about things like drug abuse or illicit drugs, there's a lot of science going on at the moment to try and find out what are these receptors within the brain and the rest of the body which uh, are responsive for the effects of, of cannabis, but uh, endogenously within the, within the brain, how communication occurs using these natural substances, anandamide and 2-AG. So they're natural transmitters or communicators within the brain and within the rest of the body, a whole lot of sites uh, that mediate uh, a range of functions. As this field's developed, those functions have begun to include the control of energy metabolism, learning, memory, cognition, movement, coordination, stress, and all these other body functions. What that tells you is not only that the endo endocannabinoid system is pervasive, but it means that when something endogenous, exogenous, sorry, from the outside, cannabis, interacts with these systems, it has the potential not only to interfere with them and disrupt them, but also potentially to have a therapeutic function. Now, in our experience at the moment, the disruptive function uh, through marijuana illegally used is the one that we tend to focus on. But it is worth keeping in mind and is part of this whole argument that there is a potential therapeutic function as well. And uh, in, in labs, various substances called agonists, which are ones which act on those receptors, have been produced, and ones which block. And they have potential medical value. Let's just put it, this at uh, the abuse of cannabis in a context so that we get some idea of what's actually going on. And I'm using some Australian figures here. 10.3% have used in the past year, and 1.5% used daily. And I believe the figures are slightly higher in New Zealand. Now the important thing about these figures is that it's very easy to misinterpret uh, statistics and use them, as we know from a whole range of other contexts, misuse statistics for a particular purpose. And so a high degree of caution is needed when we approach this. Uh, there was an uh, a, a, a activist in Australia who um, attended um, a festival called the Mardi Gras Festival which was uh, celebrating the use of uh, smoking of cannabis in a, a, a lovely little town called Nimbin, which has sort of become the cannabis capital of Australia. And when he attended that, he made a, made a comment. He said that, well, it's getting to the point where people are smoking uh, dope just as much as people are smoking tobacco. And, uh, and he got this huge uh, applause from the audience because what that did was to suggest we have this level of use, despite its illegality, despite marijuana's illegality, we have this level of use, which is so close to the tobacco, so you may as well give up and just legalise the stuff, because it's so close anyway. 
But what he was doing was conflating figures that were inappropriate for that argument. Because that figure of 10% uh, for use in the last year, the parallel figure for tobacco is 18%. Okay, so 18% and 10%. So that was his argument, they look very, very close. But what he didn't do was talk about daily use. So daily cannabis use, 1.5%, daily tobacco use, 15%. So the patterns are very different. So it's a very small percentage of people using cannabis on a daily basis, a rather high 15% using tobacco on a daily basis, but if you use those yearly figures, they start to look very much the same. So when we hear the stats, we really need to penetrate deep into the data to try and figure out what's really going on, uh, because it's usually being used in a particular way to promote a particular argument. The primary active ingredient is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. There are a whole range of other substances, and the key one here to uh, consider is CBD, that may actually, it's, a, it's the largest other ingredient, and it may have some medicinal value. Um, usually there are only a couple of active ingredients in a, a substance. So we use uh, opium as an example, codeine and morphine, which we now know has uh, been an enormous blessing to a lot of people to be able to use those substances for pain relief. So uh, just at that point, I, I, I want to add a bit of an overlay here that is a, a, a tricky one in all of these debates, and that's the question of compassion. Because we have clearly compassion for people who suffer, and that's why medicines are developed to, to assist them. We ought to also have a similar level of compassion for those who get themselves into difficulty with illicit drugs. So we have this tension between uh, compassion for people who have, have become addicted or uh, and live a lifestyle which is very damaging and destructive, not only to themselves but many of those around them. At the same time, as we are looking for a structure and a way of dealing with a problem that doesn't make their situation worse or any others who might go down that path suffer from that same set of consequences. But it's not an uncommon experience of mine to be labelled as extremely hard-hearted by suggesting that we maintain the illegality of something like marijuana. Because number one, how dare you stop people from accessing a medicinal herb and if those want to use it for recreational purpose, well, that's their business. They're not hurting anybody. It's just a personal thing. And you, you shouldn't interfere in, in that. So, um, and, and you're being hard-hearted to those who are uh, actually addicted to marijuana if you suggest that they ought to be either disciplined in any way or that the, the law should uh, make their activity a criminal activity. Uh, I won't have time to go into the, the harms that arise in the use of uh, typical recreational use of cannabis. Uh, suffice to say that if we keep in mind the previous slide and the whole range of functions which uh, the natural endocannabinoid system works through, and keeping in mind that some of those are learning, cognition, and higher functions, it's not surprising that some of the key harms with smoking marijuana relate to higher functions as well. And there's a growing body of research showing that psychosis uh, is one of those particular problems, but also uh, depression and anxiety. I just want to say something very briefly about addiction. Um, addiction itself is something that we don't have a good understanding of. There's a very powerful uh, YouTube clip going around at the moment I've uh, forgotten the speaker's name, and he, he basically is saying that all we've known about addiction is actually wrong. Uh, it's a persuasive argument, he's a superb speaker, and what he's basically saying is that we made a terrible mistake by treating people who become addicted as criminals, by criminalising the use of those substances that we're talking about. He then points to a piece of research where uh, two, it's a laboratory bit of research, where two groups of rats were treated differently with respect to their water, which was laced with an opiate, uh, like heroin. So the rats, in one context, were isolated in a cage, and they drank and drank and drank and drank the water 
until they eventually died. They were addicted to it, strongly addicted. In the other experiment, the researchers created what was effectively a rat heaven, a rat park, with toys to play with, lollies, uh, uh, fun games that rats enjoy. I don't know how you get in the mind of a rat, but lots of lovely things for rats. And the interesting thing was that the rats did not behave in the same way they did in isolation. So what this is saying is that the context of drug use is critical for the development of addiction. And whilst there are a range of theories about how addiction works, one of them is related to the poverty of relationships that people are able to develop. Damage in relationships, poverty of relationships, isolation, social isolation, and the relationship between those things and the development of an addiction. So there is a deep core to the problem as to why people end up addicted. And that goes for social, other things like gambling, non-substance related addictions. There's a similar, uh, a similar sort of process going on. But it's only part of the truth. And addiction is, is one of those things that uh, at its core is deeply harmful. Uh, quite often in this debate, uh, I frame it as a legalisation debate, addiction is actually played down. It's hardly mentioned. People will say, well, yes, uh, you've got this set of other harms that these drugs do, but we're all addicted to something. So it's lessened. It, the, the punch is taken out by saying, by watering down addiction and treating it across the board as no different than addiction to caffeine or to shopping uh, or any of those other things. But that's a really unnuanced view, and each substance and each activity needs to be considered in its own right and what it means for the individual who's addicted to that substance. But what I want to suggest is that it is a serious harm. In and of its own right, it deprives freedom. It takes away from people the opportunity to pursue the natural goods of life. It becomes a depth of focus that is destructive to all things around it. So it's a harm in its own right as well as the other more obvious ones. I want to just take a sidestep for a moment before we look in a bit more detail about uh, medical marijuana to talk about very briefly about medicine and what medicine is for because if we're going to consider something like medical marijuana, it only makes sense in an, uh, with an understanding of what medicine is really for. And I'll just go through this fairly quickly. That medicine is both a science and an art. And in the modern era, we do rely a lot on an evidence base but we need to keep in mind that it is an art in the sense that a medical practitioner who approaches a patient does so with a great wealth of, of uh, experience and knowledge behind them about how to deal with human beings, not just how to deal with evidence, evidence about how drugs work or how substances might be used therapeutically, but with a whole wealth of experience uh, in relating to human beings and what is good for human beings. So this, in effect, there's a philosophy behind medicine. And that goes to the doctor-patient relationship as well. Uh, the empirical evidence, as I've said, is, the, is really important. So modern medicine is a construction of these things. And medical ethics, I'll actually skip through this, um, partly because it'll come up later. But when it comes to medications, as we go through this list, we need to consider medical marijuana alongside this uh, group of um, procedures, if you like, or processes by which a modern medicine comes into the uh, therapeutic arena. Uh, in Australia, we have the Therapeutic Goods Administration. I presume there's something similar here in, in the US, the FDA. And typically, those peak bodies look at something and see if it's a medicine and weigh up a whole range of things and look at a whole base of information about that substance to say, yes, it is a medicine or no, it isn't. And this is the type of thing which normally happens. There are animal studies to start with, then there are clinical trials, randomised controlled trials. Um, that basically means that two groups of people, one would be given a sugar pill, one would be given the substance. They're just randomly assigned to one group or another, um, and the people would not know what they're receiving. Uh, and the operator in a double-blind study would not know what they're giving. And so basically, that's, this is the gold standard by which we figure out whether a medicine is actually having the effect that we think it might have. It's a very rigorous process. We repeat that, there's peer review, we look at negative side effects and adverse reactions, 
we make this clear distinction between use and abuse. We look at abuse potential and see how uh, something might be a good medicine, but its abuse potential is so high that on balance we'd say, well, you know, there are alternatives anyway, available alternatives, and so we might not consider that drug useful for uh, therapeutic use. And the third, second to last point there, which is I think probably uh, the really pertinent one in the medical marijuana debate, is is this done by expert opinion or by vote of non-experts in the public, public space? And that in some contexts, as we'll see, is precisely what's happened. I think um, the, uh, the context that we can consider uh, best and has some history is what's happened in the United States. And the way this began has a very interesting history, but it certainly came to a, a peak with this kind of advocacy. Public square advocacy with bland statements like marijuana is medicine, and then compassion, not federal prison. And if you look at the uh, T-shirt, you'll see daddy's little girl. My dad is not a criminal. That kind of message is very difficult to deal with because it hooks into the compassion argument very strongly. There is some legitimacy in it, but at the same time it's conflating the intent to use marijuana as medicine and its widespread recreational use with all that attendant harm. So it's a very difficult message to deal with in the public square. And I don't know whether you've had this here, I think you probably have, but what's appeared most recently in the medical marijuana space is uh, the treatment of epilepsy for children. Um, there are some anecdotal stories around that uh, uh, my child had a uh, whole range of epileptic fix, so a certain number per day. Um, now the child is taking a marijuana tincture and the epilepsy has stopped. It's a dramatic and powerful public story which makes anyone with any heart go, oh my goodness, you know, if, if, that, if that child is that well, how dare we stand in the way? It's a very difficult one to deal with. Uh, and I find it really fascinating that uh, children, and it's usually when children enter the debate, that it takes this force. It takes a lot of power immediately. Um, this is where we get into the history of what's behind uh, the medical marijuana initiatives in the United States. The funding for the initiatives, and just a little bit of history here, or the way it happens in the states, is that a proposition can be put up in a state and enough signatures gathered and then a vote conducted and that popular vote will carry the motion. Okay? So it's a bit like a mini referendum or a local referendum within a particular state. Uh, and with freedom to vote, if you have a lot of advertising, a lot of stories put out, and you promote one particular side of an argument and do it very, very effectively, then the chance of that being carried is significant. And that's precisely what's happened in now 23 US states, which now have laws permitting medical marijuana to be used. Just to a, a point of clarification that when the, uh, and this is something I think to watch out for, that the term medical marijuana typically means smoked marijuana or edible products made from whole marijuana. The difficulty here is that sometimes the media will flip and use the term medical marijuana to refer also to a specific pharma pharmaceutically prepared product derived from marijuana. But the debate in the United States and the one certainly happening in Australia is pushing very strongly for the whole product to be made available, and that includes smoking as a medicine. And I just had a quick look at the, um, a website for NORML, the National Organisation for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, uh, New Zealand, and apart from some striking misinformation all over that website, uh, it's very clear that they are still pushing very strongly for smoked marijuana as medicine. Um, so, it's worth keeping in mind what we're really talking about when, when we use that term medical marijuana. It certainly means smoked marijuana or edible products in the States. And the funding has come from 
not patient advocacy groups, as you might expect if we're talking about a medicine. You would think that, well, uh, here's a potential treatment, the uh, asthma society or the uh, a diabetes society or all those peak bodies would be pushing enormously to get this product through. But in fact, it's funded by Soros, Sperling and Lewis and their offshoot, the medical, uh, Americans for Medical Rights, who are organisations dedicated to legalising access to drugs in general for recreational purposes. So I think we can be forgiven for thinking there's some mixed motives at work. And we need to ask that question, would there be such an impetus behind, behind medical marijuana if marijuana were not psychoactive? It's on this back drop of access for recreational use that medical mar marijuana has arisen. And uh, Normals, Keith, uh, Keith Stroop, uh, this is going back to the early 90s, made it very clear, and unfortunately for him, he was actually, um, he actually quoted that publicly, that we'll use that medical marijuana scam as a red herring. The most significant funder uh, for medical marijuana initiatives was approached by Drug Policy Foundation in 93 uh, when they were looking for money uh, for their cause, which was to sort of overthrow the drug on wars, uh, the war on drugs, and uh, to make uh, drugs ac accessible legally, and uh, he his response was, well, if you if you come up with a few humani humanitarian approaches like medical marijuana, then I'll fund you, um, and uh, and he did, and he poured millions and millions into the initiatives, and now, as I said, there are 23 states. The fascinating thing is that. There's that public message. If we go to some of the peak bodies, we find that the uh, uh, FDA has come out very clear. No sound scientific studies support the medical use of marijuana for treatment in the United States, and no animal or human data supported the safety or efficacy of marijuana for general medical use. There are alternative FDA approved medications in existence for treatment of many of the proposed uses. Now, I always find it really difficult in this space wanting to promote and use good evidence-based science and finding that not only is there uh, a difficulty using that good evidence-based science to argue in the public square because all too readily it will be simply discounted. It's remarkable how it happens. You can, you can well, referring to uh, the marriage question, you can talk all you like about the large backlog not backlog, but large body of evidence which shows that the uh, need, that a child has a need for a father or mother. But on a peak Australian program Q&A just a few weeks ago, one of our, uh, the, head of, uh, the leader of the Greens simply discounted it. Just out of hand. Simply discounted it. So <laughs> not only is that a problem, but the additional problem rests with some of that scientific research itself. And this is where it gets really hard because then you have to sift through the scientific research and go, well, some of this is good and some of it's bad. And that's a very difficult problem. And f as a scientist looking in this space, I've come from a physiology background, which is a sort of a more hard science. And here we are now in this space and I can't believe what gets through. It's really disturbing and extraordinarily difficult because someone will say, oh, well, here's a published article which says blah, 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 um, and use that, and you'll go, well, yes, but if you look carefully at that article, and some have, you'll discover that there's some real problems with it. Yet it is now part of the body of scientific literature. It's a real problem, and it's a big problem in the, so the social policy area um, because it's very hard to get at hard data and solid statements without a lot of long, hard and careful research. Okay, I'll move fairly quickly because I am uh, heading forward in time. Let's just look at some of the consequences for medical marijuana use in the States. Uh, one is the proliferation of dispensaries for uh, marijuana and uh, uh, using names like Dr. Reefer and Ganja Gourmet, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating insight into what medicine has become in that square. 
Uh, that's certainly not how medicines are used. Does use change? Well, that's a particularly difficult question because, again, it goes to the, the quality of the research. There are some studies which show that in those states where medical marijuana has been permitted, use rates have climbed. And there's other data which say, no, it hasn't. It remains a very difficult problem to sift through, but there is no shortage of anecdotal evidence that there is a significant rise in use and diversion from dispensaries um, and uh, uh, from Colorado, one set of figures is that 48.8% of adolescents admitted to substance use treatment obtained from marijuana from someone who is registered medically. So there's significant diversion. In Colorado at the moment, there are something like 470 medical marijuana dispensaries, um, which outnumber uh, a lot of Starbucks coffee shops and a whole range of other outlets for uh, various other commercial items. It's huge. It's absolutely huge, huge, and to su suggest that that has actually arisen purely because of medical need is very unlikely. There's been an association identified also between marijuana use, abuse, abusive and neglectful parenting uh, related directly to the medical dispensary density in a given area. Sign significant increase in drivers testing positive for marijuana, uh, a range of other outcomes. Now, when a, as I mentioned earlier on, when a medico has someone presenting to them, they would normally go through a range of uh, testing uh, uh, questions, uh, um, analysis of that person's situation before they make a judgment about whether a medicine is good. That's the typical standard of medical care that we would expect. Unfortunately, when it comes to this area, that tends to collapse. And the normal fiduciary relationship between doctor and patient has collapsed. And doctors are placed in a position where they are the gatekeepers, or forced to be gatekeepers, uh, of something which has not run the normal process of the development of a medicine. So there's no good and solid evidence that medical marijuana in the smoke form or the edible form is a panacea for any of those conditions. But to a certain extent, it may be. And this is the problem. It's taking a long time for the science to actually catch up and identify what might be legitimate uses of marijuana. Um, in Colorado, this has panned out to um, uh, a situation where some 10% of recommendations are made by one physician and 49% made by just 15. So what that means is that there are a select group of medical practitioners who are prepared to do this and some are associated with the medical dispensaries and uh, which creates an interesting conflict of interest if they are involved with dispensing as well as uh, diagnosing possible need for the marijuana. So it's, it reminds me a little bit of what uh, has happened in the euthanasia space with uh, there will always be euthanasia doctors, there will always be medical marijuana doctors. There will always be some in the profession who will actually uh, go to a different space um, in making their judgments. What some physicians think, I suspect the other group, is that they think there's a perception of substantial revenue rather than evidence-based medicine that explains why many states have been eager to uh, legitimise medical marijuana. And in some instances, Connecticut, for example, legislators approved medical marijuana but consulted physicians with relevant expertise only afterwards. So here's a process that's happening contrary to what normally happens with medicines. That's, that's the key point about how it's developed. And the states are essentially legalising recreational marijuana but forcing physicians to act as gatekeepers for those who wish to obtain it. Many peak bodies opposed to medical marijuana. Now, this is where it gets uh, interesting. Against that backdrop of uh, what I think is clearly the misuse of the, the medical approval process to gain access to smoke marijuana, and that being used as a beachhead to legal access, and if we follow that history now, 
we have reached a point where there are four US states now that have gone that extra step and fully legalised marijuana for recreational purposes. So George Soros's suggestions get me a few, uh, get, get a few wins on the board, like medical marijuana, if you want to legalise for recreational use, has borne fruit. And so now, four states, full legal access for anyone over the age of 21. Slightly different in, the, in some of those different states, but that's really the goal of organisations like um, Normal, who've got to that point. But the rest of the story is that there is the potential for legitimate medical use of marijuana. And I'm not going to have enough time to go into that in detail. Suffice to say that there's a, a significant body of growing research which shows that the pharmaceutical products derived from marijuana, if put through that normal process of, of gaining approval as, as a medicine, may well prove to be quite good medicines. Uh, at the moment, that evidence is thin. There is not a lot done. There's some evidence on epilepsy. A recent review said that uh, there's not sufficient evidence to say one way or the other, um, which is interesting in light of the power of those anecdotal stories. Uh, but we might actually come to a point where the whole business of medical marijuana um, is actually, whoop, is actually a, f a footnote in history. We hopefully will get to the point, as we have with poppy and opium, that we no longer want to go and smoke opium because we have codeine and morphine available as good medicines. The day will come, I'm sure, when this will get sorted out, the, the mess between recreational use and legitimate medical use, and once the research is done, we'll find is there's some possibly moderate medical benefit in pharmaceutically derived components from marijuana, um, and we'll be able to separate the two properly. Then we just have to deal with our other problem of uh, recreational use per se. Okay, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Says, I know a friend who turned his health around with the use of cannabis oil after three lots of chemo proved ineffective. We've, uh, we've heard quite a few uh, stories today from individuals that are enormously powerful. And uh, I have a sort of prima facie way of approaching uh, individual stories to uh, listen to the, the person and listen to what... Uh, they say. Now, having said that, we do need to know when it comes to a medical treatment whether it actually does do anything, and we need to know that for a couple of reasons. One, that there are a whole range of treatments which people have used down the centuries that they have claimed have been beneficial. And those anecdotal cases include some from the bizarre to the possible. But the only way that we really know for sure whether it's uh, a genuine effect is to either see it directly in action that it's so blindingly obvious, like this case might sound, um, and just to believe that that's what it is, is what the person says, or to actually properly assess it scientifically in the randomised controlled trial type of setting. Now, Admittedly, a lot of the research on cannabis as a pharmaceutical product is in its infancy. We already know at this point of time that for epilepsy, for example, the data actually is equivocal. It could go one way or the other. That's what we know from the scientific studies that exist. We also have a pharmaceutical preparation which I believe has already been imported into New Zealand, Sativex, which is a, an extract. Um, and has been put, prepared by GW Pharmaceuticals, so it's a pharmaceutical product. Um, in that sort of case, that would seem to me to be the most logical avenue for that to be pursued, mm. rather than using the one exceptional case where something may be happening as the one which drives the broad and wide legality mm. of cannabis for just about any other purpose, because it's very hard to constrain, as we see within the medical context and would, mm. would spread far more broadly. So I think there are alternatives and options available. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to know whether something genuinely is effective or, given the power of the placebo effect, whether that's something that could mm. be happening. And actually, that's the exact approach being used by the Associate Minister of Health at the moment. 
What practical actions should we take to make a difference in respect to these issues? What should be our response? So perhaps, Greg, you could start, and just in the two areas that you've talked about, and then Peter in your area, what are you, what are you challenging us to do? I mean, we can go away and say it was a great feed and you guys spoke well and etc. but what do you want us to do from here? Greg? I think uh, to a certain extent that's a very personal question for each individual in terms of what they perceive their gifts and abilities to be. So I think that's the first thing to say that uh, uh, we, we may feel particularly competent in one particular sphere and not in another and we have to respect that. So it may be that we do have financial resources and we can put them to good effect. It can be that we're a good conversationalist but don't like getting up in front of a crowd and we can have the conversations about what we heard here with as many people as we can and be brave, be brave about it and be prepared to talk um, and be also prepared to say that you might not have every answer but this is what you've heard and this is what you believe to be true. And then there are others for whom it uh, can be something of a very practical hands-on nature that might involve, say for example, um, post-abortion care um, or uh, my father, for example, goes to hospital and uh, talks to people. He just volunteers and uh, he's taken on as a volunteer and he, he talks to people in very dire circumstances and comforts them at the end of life. And his sort of steadiness and, and, and surety in the way he approaches that means that uh, he brings a lot of comfort to people at the end of life. So I think, you know, have a good look within and see what you've got. 